are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. I am here today with none other than Matt Callanan. Matt, I am delighted to have you on the show. Oh, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Matt, let me, let me tell everyone a bit about you. There's, um, you're a, a special forces veteran. You're a news anchor, or you were a news anchor for the NBC News Channel. You're a serial entrepreneur. You're an expert in out-of-home media and advertising. You're the creator of the Eyewitness app, and you're currently the founder and managing partner of retail outdoor media. So it, it sounds like you've had a really dull life. I, you know, I, I, you, you could call it professionally schizophrenic, or <laughs> Walter Mitty-esque, whatever it is, but I always I make the joke, and it's certainly true that I'm uh, an inch deep and 30 miles wide. But I, <laughs> but I like change, and I like new things and new experiences, new challenges. So, But I mean, going from, you know, I have to ask this because it's just fascinating from, you know, special forces to news correspondent, mm-hmm. you know, some of the sites, some of the people, um, that must have been a hugely exciting and shaping experience. It, it was. And, and I was the youngest um, uh, uh, SFQC graduate, special forces qualification graduate in the U.S. Army at one point. I was 21 years old. And most of the guys in SF are in their 30s. And I was assigned to Central and South America back at a time when there was a a lot of uh, insurgency groups activity down in El Salvador, which is where I was based. But also the counter narcotic stuff down in Colombia was very hot. This is uh, back in the Pablo Escobar era. Um, And it was very shaping because I always felt like I was kind of faking it. You know, I was this young kid who was around a bunch of very uh, high performers, very super competitive, but bright guys. They're all like fighter pilots, if you know the type. Yeah. Um, and it, it was it was something where uh, you, you realized that, you know, you had to man up, you had to mature. Uh, you had to realize that a lot of things that are applicable to the real world in terms of process and focus. But it was all very, very serious stuff at the time. And it, it definitely there was a maturation process and extremely exciting. I mean, stuff we would do, we would read about in the New York Times a week later. And when you're 21 years old, that's pretty heady. But the, uh, but the difference now. So, you know. But now I get my news from my feed bubble on Facebook. Mm-hmm. I have no idea if it's fake news or oh, gotcha. you were there. You were creating the news. Yeah. And you became a, a, an anchor for NBC News. So how do, what do you feel when you look at the sort of news delivery now? Do you, you know, hold your head in your hands? Well, I, I, I think now more than ever, uh, if you want to have a broad, informed perspective, it's really the onus is on you as the viewer or the reader. And what I mean by that is, if I really want to get a broad based spectrum, there's so much source out there that I have to kind of read a little bit of everything. If I want to get, you know, the, the, the conservative perspective, I have to read a legitimate publication like National Review. If I want to get the, uh, the liberal perspective, I need to read The Nation or New Republic. I need to, if I want to get a, a more a liberal uh, perspective in broadcast, I go to uh, MSNBC, conversely, Fox. Yeah. Because not all of it's fake. But you need, that's why depth of coverage and information is always relevant because to really gain perspective, you can't just read some disqualified or self-qualified blogger yeah. and you can't just go to a single source for information because human beings in any endeavor make it subjective. So it's really on you to figure out how do I keep a balance of information input and then make my own determinations. Because I think that's a real challenge because um, as Facebook and social media becomes more prevalent. It becomes the source of relationships, of news, of information. And there's this concept of a feed bubble. In other words, where I only read information posted by people that are within my group. So therefore, everything is being um, sanitized or it's being changed. So so how do you um, get that depth? You know, how how do we sort of, or how dangerous is this going to become, do you think? Well, that's a very difficult thing to calculate. And I think it comes down to the the individual. I think substantive people, intelligent people will always be, uh, you know, substantive in in their their needs and interests and and, in the way they approach forming opinions and gathering information, which there's no shortcut to it. 
the greater challenge I see, uh, you know, and, and so the macro social perspective is that you're going to have increasingly people want things simple and they want it in quick data points. And, and if you live in Youngstown, Ohio, and suddenly the LTV steel plant is going to go bankrupt or there's some sort of issue with China imports, and that's an issue that affects your entire community. And let's say you have a, there's no way to understand that issue by reading a quick segment of news. You have to digest what that means uh, economically, politically for your area in Youngstown, Ohio. And I, that's probably not the best analogy in yeah, yeah. modern era, but it's, it's an old school industry that's having some evolutions now. But my point is that there's no, there's no quick solution. And I think one of the things we have to be cautious about as, as a society and as individuals is there isn't that shortcut. If you want to be, if you want to make good decisions for yourself, your family and your community, there's no way to do that in a fast way. There's no way to get it. You've got to invest the time to, to read and find the sources that you find relevant and even contrarian. You know, if I'm a conservative from, and I'll be stereotypical here, from red state Nebraska and, and I'm blue collar, my, my, I can go to Fox because that's comfortable for me. Yeah. But it's certainly not going to give me the perspective I need to really be informed. So we got to make sure we don't narrowly channel either. So do you think that, I mean, so where do you see the future of journalism? Um, and um, do you think it's going to be more distributed or do you think it's going to be more focused on sort of three or four key channels? I, I think, I think, uh, and I'm already, I think we're already seeing it it's specific to not, and we use the term journalism, right? But just the way in which we get information, we've come to the point now where there's so much resource and opportunity and so much again is specialized I think you're going to plug into, you know, your eight primary channels of information, regardless of whether that's information needed to do your, in your industry professionally, or whether it's in your personal life, because you like to kayak and you, and you, and you like to sew, you know, yeah. uh, and so forth. And then you just take that feeder system from those, from those areas. And now because of technology being what it is, you actually have introducers and the music vertical is the most obvious, right? I pick a couple songs and there's, five phenomenal resources, apps, and so forth to begin to channel to me the kind of music I'm interested in based on what my pattern of, of downloads and behavior is. I think that's going to be the way that we, we start to, there's too much out there now. We find what we, we like and we're comfortable with, and that becomes our information flow. My only addendum to that is make sure you don't just find information that you're comfortable with. Exactly. And that's, I mean, I want to talk about the eyewitness app as well, because I think that's such a fabulous idea of the ability to uh, instantly report on, on something as it's happening. Yeah. Um, but the difference with the eyewitness app, I think, is that it channels directly into the, uh, to the news channel. So it wasn't just posting it on a website. It was um, posting it somewhere where people would do something with it. Yeah, and, and that becomes an editorial decision because it didn't go direct to consumer, it went direct to media enterprise. So it goes on what's called the bird. They used to call it the bird, which is, you know, satellite flow. And then they can, people who are in the decision making positions, the producers of what goes on the news, whether that's the digital news or the broadcast news, look at what's available and they can pick from it. Yes. But what I saw uh, enter, uh, eyewitness uh, as was a tool. Yeah. Or... Uh, individuals, let's say the perfect scenario in Syria to have real impact beyond just capturing video and, uh, and interviews or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, information from people on the ground yeah. in a way that was amateurish. Here was a template. Here was a, an app that could actually capture some, something as simple as wide, medium, tight shots or interview yeah. segment in a certain way that looked professional because you and I both know the presentation is oftentimes as important as content. And that's because, and the more professional and familiar you can make that presentation in a traditional broadcast format, the more relevant and real, as you say, that information seems. So if you can have the amateur who's on the ground in, in Aleppo shooting content that can then be resourced over to a network that can then be edited in-house by them and presented, that makes everybody a journalist. It makes everybody professional. And if you can do that through a technology, I thought that would be dynamic. And so if you've, so you've grown up, you know, hard, you know, school of hard knocks, as it were, you've been out there, um, you, know, you know, in the thick of it, as it were, as a special forces veteran, you reported 
through the NBC News Channel. Do you feel that the reportage and the journalism today is all about getting views, getting subscribers, getting hits, becoming internet famous? Do you um, tear your hair out with frustration with the way that you see the, the quality falling? Or do you see there are real opportunities now to, um, to, to harness social media for, 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 for good? Well, it, news became monetized, uh, particularly so in the late 80s. You know, news, news outlets used to always be the, the flagship for the networks. The networks now are a bit of a dinosaur, right? And they were always seen as being um, the, 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 the character of and really the personality of um, uh, the network itself. And there was always... A, you know, going back to Edward R. Murrow, you know, there is, there is, or, or, or so many other, uh, you know, great uh, early broadcasters yep. that, you know, they were, they were seen as being um, the, the holders of integrity, the fourth estate. They were the people who were supposed to present things in a way that allowed us as a democracy people to, to make good decisions. But when you monetize something, now you're taking information and having to package it in a way that is appealing and interesting. And we all know that it's very difficult, difficult to look away from the car wreck. It's yeah. plane falls, you know, you're, it's anything that's dynamic and flashy and compelling is going to draw you. And of course that, that leads to the, the throughout the, uh, into the nineties, the bleeds it leads mentality. And as soon as they started to draw viewers, obviously that increases ad revenues. And now that that com the dollar becomes so much more competitive yeah. in digital and all the rest and really just, just, I think, our social interests, the fact that the, again, not to disparage the Kardashians per se, but that becomes now culturally iconic, the Kardashians, why? What's, yes. Where's the substance there? That maybe our interests have become a little bit debased over time, and who's going to change that kind of social flow? And then obviously, what coverage, you know, when you have Entertainment Tonight drawing more viewers after CBS Evening News than CBS Evening News did, that says a lot about us as a society, and it's, it's disappointing to me. Yes. But again, but the question then is, is, is this a, a dive that we're going to pull out of? Is technology um, going to solve the problem, or is this just a spiral that we're in, do you think? Yeah. I think? I think it's a slow spiral, and I don't, I'm, I've always been the eternal optimist in, in, in people, and people talk about you know, global warming. We'll, I, I really feel we'll figure that out. Yes. I don't know. I'm not informed in that arena, but I really do always seem to have a, a general sense that you know, um, uh, competency and meritocracy and, and fairness and, and decency will prevail. Um, the challenge is, is that you know, it does really does become about the dollar, and, and I think there's always going to be a place for very legitimate information sources, and there's always going to be a place for substantive people. Um, uh, and I think also the cream, you know, just yep. general Darwinian, Darwinism at work, the cream will rise to the top, and those aren't, aren't simple-minded people. But again, overall, the, the macro landscape, I, I think it's, it's slowly but surely becoming fourth century Roman Empire. Well, and also it's funny, but I'm, I'm also seeing a rise in um, interest in human um, improvement. So in other mm. words, there's, there seems to, and, and I'm just wondering through, because you're also, you, you've taken your um, huge amount of experience in, in communicating. So you're now very heavily involved in um, advertising, marketing, communicating ideas to people on a mass market basis. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how people are going to change uh, in the near term. So how do you uh, find ways of taking your advertising um, business and your um, experience as a correspondent and as a communicator to, to, forge um, or, or to create methods of communicating with people for businesses? Yeah. You know, in this particular arena, you'd like to think that you're serving the greater good, <laughs> but it is a service and a product. And, and, you know, who are the masters to serve? And the masters to serve are, you know, the brands, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the client themselves. So from that perspective, you know, there are some essential uh, elements of human nature that you just try to, you know, what are the wants, interests, and needs of people, and how do you present that information in a way that's compelling to them 
visually and in message, right? And I always look at it and go, okay, if we can do that um, uh, and we can appeal to uh, also uh, a quality of media, you know, something that looks nice and isn't blighted, you know, because yes. advertising can be a blight no matter what it is, uh, whether it's digital or out of home. So how do we make something elegant and nice looking? That's one way to go about doing it. If you can find the genius in the moment to articulate a message that not only communicates, say, a value of a service or product, but also um, uh, its humanity in what it does. I mean, insurance is a perfect example of that. Insurance historically has saved people that had their homes burn in, in a fire and yeah. gave them their lives back. And how do you appeal to that humanity? And some people find that voice and they find that marketing message and they do a great job. I think they enhance the commercial dialogue and other people just shill stuff. So it's an ongoing effort and it's hard to uh, uh, sell toilet paper humanely. <laughs> you know, but it depends on where you are. Sometimes, you know, it can be a godsend. I can tell that's, you. That's right. It kind of depends on the circumstances, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But I think talking of humanity, so um, the context is um, that everything's been cheapened by the sort of onslaught of social media. Humanity has taken a, 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 a sidestep. Um, is it going to come back? What, is, what do you think the value of relationships will be? Is it going to be thrown away for good? Or are you seeing um, you know, relationships and the value of that sort of human contact? Is there a resurgence? Is there a, uh, um, a renaissance of, uh, of the value of human, rela of human uh, relationships? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, that's, I think the pendulum, it seems to swing to such a degree in one respect, and then almost inevitably it comes back. And if you look at sometimes in environmental policy, you know, there was a period where, you know, you could throw anything into a river and then it got to the point where you couldn't, you know, cut down a tree in, in Portland, in, in Oregon, because of the spotted owl. I mean, there seems to be these massive pendulum swings. And again, common sense reaches its own watermark. And I think there's a point at which people go, they'll be in, in Glacier National Park and all four members of a family will be on a phone and I hope there's a moment of actualization. I think there will be where they'll go, what are we doing? Let's put our technology away and, and take this hike and, and, and breathe deeply and drink deeply of the waters. I think so. And I think we're starting to see a lot of those voices, even within the tech industry. I, I don't recall the gentleman's name, but there was a 60 minutes piece the other day about how they are baking into algorithms, uh, 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 a manner in which, you create uh, addiction to technology and how yeah. it's very thoughtfully done, even to the point of holding likes on Snapchat to certain periods where you're likely to view it. So you, you get all these gifts at once and how that then reconnects you with Snapchat and wants you to re-engage on that technology. They literally designed an algorithm to notice what your behaviors are and how to in, in, increase engagement. It's kind of online crack, as it were. Well, it's the same thing as the, the big tobacco did with infusing tobacco with additional nicotine. Um, and I think there's something nefarious about that. And it's something certainly manipulative without being transparent to your audience about it. And, and now there's voices going, wait a minute, uh, should we be doing that? And the counter voice is, wait a minute, we've got stockholders to serve and our share price is all important. Um, which again has its own good to the society writ large. So I, I don't know who's going to win this battle uh, in the margin, but I like to, I like to, I'm liking that I'm seeing more voices coming back and saying, hey, let's let's take a pause and look at what we're doing here. Because and I think, but with again the field that you're in, which is um, uh, out, outdoor or out of home media, there's some really exciting developments where with with people are trying to get people's faces out of their phones, and so. Mm -hmm a lot of the developments with augmented reality, I think are really exciting in your field. Um, for example, you know, where you can stand next to one of the um, sort of designs that you have, one of the, 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 uh, um, the well, there's a point of purchase or a, it could be a sticker. It can be an image on a reusable grocery bag. Right. And it just leaps out. And so with, with your phone, you can actually see the history of the, um, you know, of the product, or you can see this whole story behind it. So, yeah. um, that, that, well, that's it's such an augmented reality. Uh, first of all, the technology has evolved to the point where it's super clean, it populates quickly, and then it gives you this compelling experience as, as, a, as a consumer. And I, I hate to go dark for a moment, but I think there were 12 people who died as a result of that Pokemon Go globally. 
Yes. Because they would walk out into traffic chasing, you know, whatever one of those characters are. And it actually, they were so fixated on that, they were walking into traffic. Yeah. So that shows you how absorbing that technology is. And when you look at connecting uh, augmented reality as a three-dimensional experience with product, um, with, uh, you know, the, the uh, it's basically virtual reality without the headset. So it's yes. in the moment with things like incentives and, and being able to deliver uh, coupons, discounts, contests, putting you in the moment where you, you may, you feel like you have the concert of Shakira all around you in a, in a two dimensional image that that's, that's just cool. There's no yes. other way to phrase it. It's just cool. Yeah. And is that the sort of stuff that you're working on with retail outdoor media? It is. And I don't mean to plug my business here, but I think a lot of people are doing it. Um, Walmart is doing it and, and they're looking at ways to create um, uh, an experiential experience. Uh, Cliff Bar, I'll give you yes. an anecdotally. You did an experience where they had this new point of sale near uh, the uh, a, a point, of pro- point of purchase, you know, like a, like a display near yes. the point of sale and at REI stores. And you could go up and you could watch this army of people crawling up the display yeah. to grab a cliff bar at the top. It looked like they were rock climbing up of it. And it looked phenomenal. You almost wanted to reach out and, and be a part of it. And, and those are the kinds of things. And we can do it with, uh, you know, it can be done on a bus bench. It can be done on a panel. It can be done on anything. And really the, the, where we're at now in the, in, in the marketing of that is that getting consumers to number one, realize that that is an available experience and then driving those behaviors through calls of action and through um, incentives to opt in. Because once they opt in, they get this great, cool thing, but also the client gets big data, you know, behavioral stuff and a way to, to you know, upsell, cross-sell and, and just generally engage the consumer. And do you see, I mean, from your experience as being in the industry, do you see that as being the major drive forwards or is it something that's on the side that's a bit of tech that the, that the, the majors are sort of playing with? Well, let me give you the hockey stick of the spend because follow the dollars and you'll find out. Ad Week last year published an article and said um, $190 million was spent in uh, 2016 on augmented reality. Uh, that figure by 2022 will be $220 billion on augmented reality. So from $190 million to $220 billion, uh, you know, again, uh, marketing-wide. And that's Adweek, which obviously is, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, a, a real sort of... Um, um, the bellwether. The, the information the... And, 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 you know, watches the industry very closely. That's a massive amount of, of investment uh, and that's where the spends are going. So it's not on the, it's not on the fringes. So what does that mean? So as a consumer experience, if I'm walking through a shopping mall, w- what am I going to see in 2022? Well, um, uh, you know, that's the, in, in technology terms, that's the next epoch so far away because things happen so fast. Right. So me, let me describe the kinds of things I, I see happening in, um, in, in your local grocery store. You can have, uh, or Marvel movie will be coming out. So you now have an experience as you walk through the grocery store for your kids to follow the, a Marvel contest. And that Marvel product is connected to uh, 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 Kellogg cereals. So to find, to catch the bad guy with your kids are following on the floor through these various images, the bad guys have a big fight right in front of Kellogg cereal. And oh, by the way, at the end of it, there's a digital coupon in your phone that you press on. You get 50 cents off Cheerios. And mom's standing right there at Cheerios because their kids led them over to the cereal aisle. So it's the kind of things that you, you drive the experience into what you hope is a consumer purchase behavior. Uh, and then you supplement it with an incentive coupon to, to purchase. And by the way, to get all of that, I have to opt into the Kroger's app or to the Kellogg's app or to the Marvel app. And now I know your name, your phone number, and I can claw back all pre-existing behaviors and for better or for worse, there's an awful lot that's now known about you by Kellogg's and by Kroger. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing we're talking about where we link in the experience with the, the product purchase and it's tied directly to that. They can trace that that happened as a result of that AR experience and that Marvel tie-in. And that's, so what's happening is the, the kids are walking around with their phone, you know, just in front of their faces. And because they're, as they move their phone around the store, they can, 
all of these, a bit like Pokemon Go, all of these things leap out in front of them. So it creates this incredibly three-dimensional experience. Mom, so you, mom, you, come this way, come this way. And again, you lead them in that direction. You can do that in so many other areas. I just try to come up with a fairly uh, simple uh, example. But yeah, it becomes this thing that's a driver. And um, I think there's, because of how uh, uh, clean, linear, and, and compelling the technology is now in terms of creating this three-dimensional experience, they gave all these kids in this, um, without telling what they were about to experience, uh, I think it was SeaWorld that had sponsored this. They, they gave, um, it was the Cousteau Society. They went around to this tour of these high schools and they said, all the kids, bring out your phone and you know, put it on. They were all in, in a basketball court, uh, indoor, you know, yeah. like a stadium. And they've done, and they had this whole show with whales that dove out of the Amazing. floor. And yes. what was interesting about it wasn't just how you could see a 50 foot whale yeah. come out of the basketball floor with a splash. I saw it. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Was it? Uh, and, but the audience reaction and you heard the, whoa. And yes. it was literally like a, a, a cheer, like a, like a roar of this experience. And these are from high school kids that are very, uh, technically immune to experiences and they watch this show and I thought that shows you the impact it has on people's emotions and interest. And that's so this is great news because I think this is a really valuable um, or a very exciting development of um, that sort of immersive social media technology. Um, but the fact that it's driven by advertising dollars means it's very likely to happen as opposed to being coming out of a, some sort of design budget. Of course, and really, that's always going to be the, the, the challenge in, in how we look at things is, you know, how do we get it done without the money being behind it? And, and so with the advent of, you know, I think Google Glass and mm. the fact that that's going to be launched. So next five years, I think it's going to be hugely interesting just to see that, that merge. And coming back to what we were saying earlier about how people relate to people um, and how it's changed from being that sort of handshake, the physical to the, to the virtual world. And with augmented reality, it's going to really blend what is physical and what is non-physical. So uh, yeah. who knows in a few years, people will find it very difficult to tell the difference. I, that, that's, that's interesting. And, and maybe that's all part of our evolutionary process as human beings, that, that, that comfort in that area, that skill set that's developed in doing, making that transition the, the introduction of um, artificial intelligence in doing an awful lot of our thinking for us, um, you know, basically becoming data uh, uh, beings, you know, versus cerebral beings. I, I don't know if there's a distinction there, but who knows where that's going to go? I mean, that's, that's the stuff of science fiction, and yet it's not really that far away. It no, I was going to say, we're talking. Times, and we're not young guys, you know? Yeah, we're talking. Yeah, yeah, but this, I, I can see, you know, uh, these sorts of things happening in three, four, five years. But the other amazing thing that you're doing sort of blends that with, I want to talk about a father forever, because if people see the virtual world now is becoming so real that things we see on screen, things we see on our phones, as they leap out in an augmented reality way, we give them credibility that in, in a way that we never would have done before. Mm -hmm. That when we look at TV, historically, it's on the TV, it's not real. But now we're finding it, uh, we're, we're blending reality and, and mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. And what you're doing with A Father Forever is, is almost taking that, but, but creating a, an incredibly meaningful um, outcome. And, and can you t tell, t talk a bit about that? You know, it's a, it's a project of, of passion for me. Um, uh, uh, the Father Forever is a fairly simple uh, idea. The execution is always uh, the challenge, right? It's, it's, it's an opportunity for uh, patients who, um, parents who have a terminal condition uh, to be able to create a digital postcards, as we call them, that are then delivered to their children at seminal moments, meaningful moments in their lives. So, uh, if you're, uh, you know, uh, a father who's in stage four and has a nine-year-old daughter, clearly the concern and probably the greatest fear for almost any father would be the inability to be there and to help guide and offer uh, advice and just contribute and be a part of their child's life ongoing. We thought if we were able to capture that, um, that kind of in, uh, interaction and, and opportunity uh, to communicate uh, at different significant periods of their life, you know, say the, the upon graduation. And we yeah. all know 
when we were 18 at high school or 21, 22 in college, we thought we knew everything and we now know we knew very, very little, right? And if you're able to create a postcard where your father who passed away when you were in third grade is able to suddenly be delivered to you through a, a trusted family member and you can watch a 10, 15, 20 minute message of goodwill and hope and love and support and guidance on here's your next stage in life and here's what I hope for you and I wish I could be there for you but I promise I'm with you in spirit and then what a gift that would be because it doesn't ever create finality of the relationship which is very unless you have very very deep faith and even then there's always that that percentage of unknown it's hard to, to think well he's not he is still there and oh by the way there's another one that shows up the day before your wedding and another one shows up maybe on the day of your first born and all these are messages at seminal moments in your life that make sure that the father continue to be a contributing member of your a part of your life and allows the child to share with that parent um, uh, important, uh, meaningful moments in their own lives. So but, but I think the real skill and where this, where what you're doing really merges all of your experience is the fact that you can't just video someone and say, um, please leave a message for your daughter's graduation, which will be in five years. So you need to really harness all of your communication skills, your ability to relate to people, to empathize with them in that position, to guide them as to what to say. And, and do you find that is the challenge? It's not the, it's not the videography, it's not the set, it's actually getting people to project themselves to yeah. the point where they're imagining their daughter's graduation or their, their son's wedding. And is that, is that the magic that you bring to this? Well, I, I work with excellent collaborators, uh, seasoned videographers and, and editors and field producers that are very good at tapping into something that they recognize is important to get right. And I've been surprised and pleasantly uh, surprised by um, oftentimes the parent recognizing that this is important. This isn't about how I'm presenting myself. This isn't about, you know, there's, a, there's no introspection to it per se. It's about, you know, uh, I need to communicate these things of importance to my child. This is a, a unique opportunity to do it. And they, they rise to the occasion. And I've been very pleased by that. And I think the third component is preparation. You make sure you establish a relationship with them. You don't have an interview. You have a conversation and a dialogue and you talk about a variety of things. You give them information up front for they begin to form thoughts and messages to communicate and how they're going to do it. And then you maybe, you know, like you and I and the questions you ask, by the third time you ask the question, the same question, by the third time I would answer that, that same question, we're going to get it right. It's going to be yeah. cogent and on point and deeper. Uh, and that's maybe sometimes we just circle back to the same points two or three times. And, and, and then that's the magic sometimes done in the edit room. So we, if you approach it with the right process, and also the right circumstances, which these folks realize that it's, uh, it's, it's important to get right. They seem to do, you know, excellent, excellent at, at, at their jobs. And, I, and, I, I, and that must be such a humbling experience to see people with moments of absolute clarity and mm -hmm. the messages that they, that they want to leave, where maybe they've had a, a lifetime of confusion, but just at the right moment, it, it is just clarity and you're capturing that yeah that is the legacy that they're leaving for their children well i don't know if i could even extend upon what you said because it was beautifully phrased i think you're right you're you've left them a legacy that they can themselves be proud of uh and again it's it's i've always found people seem to rise to the occasion um you know everyone's a hero in their own way given the right set of circumstances and opportunity right and these people parents i think in general are heroes you know every day they sacrifice for their kids, most do. And, and, and under these set of circumstances, so many people that you'll meet aren't the least bit concerned about themselves. They're concerned about their children and their wives and how they're going to manage without them. And that's heroic. There's no other way to look at it. Um, and they go with dignity. And our mission and our responsibility is to make sure we do right by them. And we take that really seriously. And, and um, it's enormously gratifying. And I think really with, we talk about technology, but it's not technology. It's just a different way of communicating. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is potentially the beginning of, of a whole new way of um, you know, using 
people's experience to train and to teach people how to communicate, will that lead on to um, a desire for a much greater understanding of emotional intelligence? Yeah. Um, and um, will we see that being taught in schools as yeah. opposed to technology? You know, I, I certainly think it's a valuable addition to the curriculum. <laughs> you know, you know, a course in um, not humanities, but perhaps a course in humanity. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's funny. It's one of those things we talked about early prior to, to, uh, to, uh, to taping here that, um, you know, as you get older, you start to recognize the value of the connective tissue and the value of relationships and the, the, all these kinds of things that aren't just about uh, networking and process and, and, you know, um, uh, sort of ambition, really. And I think that, that um, I think, like you said, the, polit- the, the pendulum's going to swing to the point where people go, okay, we, we're deep enough in technology, we're deep enough in these, these efficiencies, if you will, of, of communication. Now, how do we get back to meaningful engagement? And when you look at a lot of the things that are now out there, groups to join, you know, I know you're, you're a, 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 a member of Metal and yeah. any other group of, uh, you know, fairly accomplished businessmen, but having a conversation about, about how to be better people and having a con- there's no phones really in that room. There's no people checking and leaving to do texts. And these are people that run large or important organizations. And yet they, they make that time because they realize, and everybody leaves really on a certain high if, you, if, if you've had the same experience I have. So I think people start to find that maybe it's set aside in time, or maybe we're going to live more compartmentalized lives where there's, here's our tech time. And now maybe here's our out in the world time, you know? So I don't know, but um, uh, it's, we're going to find out, you know? Yes. I think that's, that's, it's, it's just hugely exciting. I think we're almost at this sort of pivot point where we value relationships, emotional intelligence, communications far more because we're seeing the specter of, you know, social media is this sort of a, you know, the antithesis of what we want to be. So yeah. hopefully we can pull ourselves out of the weeds before it's, uh, before yeah. it's too late. I've always thought there was a, there's a fascinating, almost a divine providential balance to the universe. You know, for everything great, there's almost a perfect negative. And if you look at something like Facebook, um, you know, but for me personally, I've never been a joiner. I have a lovely extended big Irish Catholic family, but you know, they're so big that will go sometimes a couple of years before I talk to my, one of my nephews. And, and yet I, when we, we re-engage, it's like not a day has passed. Yeah, yeah. And Facebook is perfect for that because I can tap a like, or I can check on this, or I get an update on their lives and we can have a connection ongoing that would never have happened otherwise. Is yes. it a deep and meaningful connection? No. But is it better than no connection? Absolutely. So it allows us to communicate in a way in a far larger scope and scale that simply life, day-to-day life doesn't allow us to do. Yes. Firstly, when's the last time I wrote a deep and meaningful letter to my brother? I know. 10 yeah. years. When's the last, and, and because I liked that photo, he was just in the Keys fishing. Yeah. The Keys, and I, I wrote a little note. Because of that, did I not maybe call him? And yeah. say, hey, you know, in the evening while he's watching the sunset, smoking his cigar. So maybe there's, we, again, the good, the yin and the yang of the good and bad of, of the perfect equilibrium in the universe, cosmos, you know, we have to kind of figure out for ourselves where that balance lies and, and always keep a mind to that human connection. Which is, which is just uh, yeah, phenomenal. So uh, going back to Father Forever, is that a project that is, is that your primary, do you see that as becoming something that is, your primary sort of objective or is that something that you're working on as a collaborator? Um, it, it's, it's always going to be a niche product. Uh, yeah. And thankfully so there's, <laughs> you know, access to re- resourcing of all the things that I found to be uh, challenges in execution here. And you mentioned some of the tactical things in a room with somebody trying to create the best possible, for lack of a better term, product mm-hmm. um, experience for their kids. Um, that wasn't the challenging part. The challenging part was actually making the connection to the client that wanted to participate in this for a variety of reasons, privacy yeah. and uh, timing, because yeah. obviously when you have somebody in that kind of condition, the last thing you want to do is, you know, show up to measure the casket. If there isn't a terminal, con- you know, that things aren't, yeah, yeah, yeah. the prognosis is poor at the same token, it can't be so far down that progress that it, they're really having a difficult time either communicating or, yes. 
that image would be upsetting to their children, you know, the, the perception of suffering. So you yes. have to find a, a window with people in a certain condition, a certain time. So there's, fortunately, there's not going to be a, a lot of people having to manage that circumstance in their life, um, at least not in, in Southern California. So it's always going to be a niche program, but each one of them is a, is a life enhancing experience for us and hopefully a life contributing experience for the, for the client and their children. Wonderful. That's brilliant. I, I can't thank you enough, Matt. How, how, how do people get in touch with you? How do they find out more um, about what you're doing? How do they contact you? How do they, how do they find out more about what you're doing with retail outdoor media, for example? Well, if from a commercial side, let me, let me put father forever first. Uh, if there's someone who would like to uh, have a participation, either from people that they know that would like to uh, have a family member or a friend that would like our kinds of, of services, uh, please contact me. Uh, my email address is my first name, M-A-T-T, at retailoutdoormedia.com. Uh, and you're welcome to, well, I won't leave my phone number. Let's go ahead and go with the uh, email address. And, and from a commercial side, if, if you want to have um, some excellent opportunities to reach audience through us, uh, particularly in a retail setting, you know, please contact me the same way through our website. Well, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, thank you very much. And I really look forward to seeing you again, talking to you again. It, you know, it's been fantastic. It has been. You're a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.